Hey everybody, this is Klaus from Plant B Seas and I'm with Dr. Michael Greger. I am excited to be on Plant Based News. Check it out. Let's talk about your new book. How not oh, to yeah. diet. Yeah. Right? What's has that been in the works? Like the last Oh my time god. Yeah, so I spent over a year of my life. It is the it has been the toughest research project I've ever taken on in my life. Because of the success of How Not to Die, the previous book, do you feel like you've got a potential like second album? Syndrome where it's like you're probably busier now than you were in 2013 and 14 and 15 doing How Not to Die. How has it been? It's just a tougher book to write just because the obesity literature is not only massive, but it's very contradictory. So uh, very simple research questions like should you skip breakfast? Should you exercise before or after meals? Um, I mean, little teeny things. These are each thousand paper research questions. There's a thousand papers on this. Some say one thing, some things, and you say, well, wait a second, how could similar experiments come to different results? So you really have to dig deep into the primary literature, read all the original studies yourselves, and make up your own mind, um, and bring it out to people. And so, you know, once I was doing this, I realized, no wonder there's never been a resource like this before, because it's just too big to take on. But, you know, I've got an army of researchers, um, and so, you know, we were able to, to distill all the best science um, on the topic into one resource, and uh, I just can't wait for it to get out and to get into people's hands. What is the executive summary of that one resource? Like, what are the key take home pieces of information people know they want to, for example, lose weight and tackle obesity? Yeah, so originally, I mean, kind of uh, to the title, How Not to Diet, I was recently going to have a chapter on each of all the kind of leading popular, pr you know, press diets, like the keto diet and the paleo diet, and just kind of on down the list. You know, I'm in the U.S. News and World Report uh, dietary, like, a panel of experts. You know, that every year we do, like, the best diets kind of thing. And so I realized how many diets are. I mean, there's just every year there's 30 new diets around. And I realized, you know, the book, no matter how up to date I am, by the time the book comes out, it's already going to be out of date because there's already new diets. Um, and so it's like playing whack-a-mole, right? And so instead of just going through each of the, of the current diets, I decided to kind of create the optimal weight loss diet from the ground up by coming up with a list of criteria for what an optimal weight loss diet would look like. So I came up with 17 criteria. So these are the 17 things that uh, that you can put any new diet plan in the future against. You say, okay, well, how good is this for weight loss? Let's put it up against the 17 criteria. You can do it for any eating pattern, any meal plan, any meal, any particular food individually, um, and just see it. So it's like, a little, it's like a little workbook kind of thing. Here's the 17, how many check marks does it get? And so from them, you can come up with kind of the optimum weight loss diet. That's the first half of the book. So. If you're doing everything right and you're still got high blood pressure, okay, hibiscus tea, flax seeds, oh, cholesterol's still too high, you do this, 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 and this. So the average vegan, for example, perfect body weight, 22.5 BMI, okay, but it's a bell curve. So if there's still any stubborn pounds you're difficult to get in, there are specific foods that act as fat blockers and starch blockers and appetite suppressants and, you know, kind of on the endless metabolic boosters, foods that, um, uh, that interfere with the, the metabolic slowdown that happens with weight loss. I mean, on down the list. So, you know, this is the Daily Dozen and How Not to Die. And we're actually going to be updating the Dr. Greger, Dr. Greger's Daily Dozen app on iPhone and Android free, of course. Um, we're going to be updating it. It'll be updated by the time the book comes out. And so there'll be like a weight loss setting. So you can switch over to the weight loss setting and it'll add these 21 tweaks um, to accelerate weight loss, regardless of what you eat. Um, uh, now, of course, ideally we want people eating healthy and then accelerate weight loss after that. Um, and so, for example, there are simple spices, proven and randomized, placebo-controlled trials to accelerate weight loss for literally pennies a day, like garlic powder, like g ground ginger, um, and so I go through how much, you know, garlic, so I think it's like two cents worth of garlic a day found to accelerate weight loss. And you can, you know, and they, so some foods are so potent, you can pack it into a pill and you can, you know, pit it head to head against a placebo sugar pill and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that this food substance itself accelerates weight loss or, you know, on down the list. Um, and so there's a bunch of spices. Um, uh, there's uh, negative calorie preloading. There's some foods you can eat that basically... Um, end up uh, actually kind of subtracting calories from your diet as opposed to adding. I talk about exercise optimization, sleep optimization, stress, 
um, every possible kind of tip and technique that's been proven in the scientific literature to accelerate weight loss, I have included in the book, right? But look, if, you're, if you want, you know, testimonials and before and after pictures, you have come to the wrong place. I'm not interested in anecdotes, I'm interested in evidence, and that's what this book does. It puts the science together, and so if anyone wants to know what the science actually says, and says kind of, instead of, you know, cutting through all the BS in the diet industry, um, I've got a book for you. There's a lot of information about the carnivore diet recently. Oh, how does Jesus. that one, for example, Jordan Peterson oh, is uh, on this carnivore diet kick. Uh, how does that stack up against the, the criteria that you mentioned? So, well, one of the criteria is low in added sugars. So presumably someone who's eating a lot of meat is not eating a lot of sugar. So they would get, so I think it's, they would get one out of 17. So it could be worse. So if you were eating a meat and cotton candy diet, that would be worse. And what are the other criteria? Uh, so the other criteria, including uh, rich in high-fiber foods, uh, which, uh, rich in water-rich foods, low in added fats, uh, particularly satiating, there's low um, uh, insulin impact, um, um, anti-inflammatory, um, clean from uh, uh, these so-called obesogenic pollutants, um, and on down the list. Are you worried that it would maybe complicate it for people that just want to kind of get into plant-based living? For example, McDougal, Dr. McDougal, you've been to his conference, you've worked with him. Yeah. He's very much um, all for making it very simple. Do you worry that maybe perhaps honing on these little details makes it more complicated for people? Well, I want, see, I, I don't want to be anybody's guru, right? I, I don't want anyone to be like, well, just tell me what to eat. In fact, that is the root of the problem, is people giving up their you know, uh, their, their, their own kind of uh, uh, giving up their power and saying, look, it's too complicated, throw my hands up in the air, I'll just let you decide what I should eat. That's dangerous because who knows what, you know, crackpot will come along and say, ah, you got to drink celery juice or whatever, right? I mean, it's, I mean, you, if there was any decision in life to be based on the best available amounts of evidence, based on evidence, it should be the health well-being of yourself and your family. Look, if you want to like, you know, uh, buy a new toaster on Amazon, then the random opinion of strangers may actually be useful, right? Someone has a little review, says, I love this toaster. You're like, okay, right, okay, fine, right? Now, but, but when it comes to something, I mean, you know, uh, when I was in clinical practice, uh, you know, I'd ask, well, why are you eating this way? Oh, well, someone at the gym said that it was, you know, told me it was the best. What? You know, a checkout aisle magazine is what you're feeding your family? Like, I mean, if there was anything to actually do some digging on, you know, uh, see what the actual evidence says, you would seem to be kind of, you know, your health and longevity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, and so that's, I mean, look, and this is the resource. I mean, nutritionfacts.org is the resource I wish I had as a medical student. So when patients asked me, you know, should I take a multivitamin? Should I, and I was like, I don't know, no one ever taught me this, right? So I had to do it, I had to look it up. And then once I already look it up, okay, now I have this information I want to share. How do I get it out to people? I can tell that one patient, but I'm sure lots of other patients have that same idea. And so that's where this, this kernel of the idea for nutritionfox.org came from. I want this resource to be the go-to resource on what does the best available balance of evidence say right now about all the questions you have about health and nutrition. You mentioned that the book and what you're saying is based on thousands of studies. What are some standout studies that really make you think, wow, that was really influential and influenced? Oh you my God, there's some crazy studies. I mean, and I, I mean, I didn't think I'd be surprised. I, I mean, I, I mean, there were some questions that I, that I you know, knew there's evidence of both ways and I was just curious as where they'd fall out. But then there's just some crazy stuff out there. Um, uh, so uh, some of my favorite things, so there, I do a whole chapter on chronobiology, which is kind of the effects of your circadian rhythms on, on, uh, on your biology. So the, the uh, U.S. military did a study where if you feed people 2,000 calories at one meal, either breakfast or supper, exact same foods, exact same calories, you gain different amount of weight. So morning calories, turns out, morning calories don't count as much as evening calories. You gain more weight eating the same snack in the evening than the same snack in the morning. That's mind-blowing. Right? So, I mean, a calorie is not a calorie, right? It's not just what you eat, but when you eat it and what combination you eat things and what context you eat things. I mean, crazy stuff like that. After how much sleep do you eat something, does it have a different effect on your body? Um, so, 
so I did a whole chapter. I mean, it's just remarkable stuff. You take drugs at different times, give chemotherapy at different times, you uh, try to commit suicide at different times from poisoning, totally different results based on what time of day. Absolutely cool. So that whole chronobiology thing just rocked my socks off. I'm actually going to have a whole long series of videos on nutrition facts about it. In fact, you know, because I want to do videos on everything I, everything I learned in the book. The book's so incredibly long that, I mean, I'm going to go for years and years putting out these videos, but the first thing I, I, I wanted to cover was chronobiology stuff. That's just cool stuff. Um, what are some other uh, crazy results? The, uh, the, the broad study? Oh, well, the bro the how, about the bro how about the single? Well, see, you don't want to give it away. Here's the, all right, spoiler alert, everybody. So I wanted to know what is, so after I go through, here's the 17 criteria. Um, and I say, okay, so let's, so let's see how good this is. So let's put the 17 criteria together. And it turns out the single diet that best matches all 17 criteria for ideal weight loss diet is a diet centered around whole plant foods. Okay, so let's now look into the medical literature and see if our prediction came true. And so what, let's look at all randomized control trials um, that didn't have like some exercise component that didn't restrict people's calories. I mean, you know, you lock someone in a room, you can lose as much weight as they want. Okay, but in terms of, you know, eat as much as you want. Um, and they found, let's look at all the randomized trials. See, was the single best, most effective weight loss intervention ever in the history of medicine. And it was a study in 2017, the broad study by a group of New Zealand researchers that went into the, one of the poorest areas of the country with the highest obesity rates, and they randomized people to either standard medical care or just information about plant-based eating. No meals were provided. They were just informed, semi-weekly meetings, about the benefits of plant-based eating. Uh, so a three-month study. Um, uh, and so even though um, there were you know, no restrictions of portions, no counting calories, any of that stuff, um, those in the broad study lost 19 pounds. Now, 19 pounds is a pretty respectable weight loss for a three-month study, uh, but then the study was over. Um, and the researchers um, were just curious and decided to call everyone back at six months just to see how much weight they gained back. Yeah, sure, in the study, you lost 19 pounds, right? But then, okay, six months, let's see how much you gained back after being kind of released out into the wild. No more instruction, no more anything. So they come back six months later, and so, you know, so at the end of three months, the end of the study, they were down 19 pounds. But after six months, they were only down 27 pounds. They lost even more weight. They got even better. Why? Because they felt so much better on a plant-based diet. Their, their physical symptoms improved. Their mental health improved. They got off so many of their medications that they were sticking to it on their own. Forget what the research is. They, I mean, they felt so good, they were sticking to it. They came back in a year later. They kept the, even studies that last a whole year, where you're actually instructing people to stick to whatever diet for a whole year. Yeah, in the first few months it goes down, but then it creeps back up. People don't live after a whole year. They, they were out of the study for a year and still retain that weight loss. Dozens of pounds of weight loss. Um, and so it is the most, even though it only lasted through it, it is the most effective weight loss intervention, six to 12 months in any other um, uh, comparable study in history. And so that just gives, um, you know, credence to this whole, I mean, so, so that's how I end the, the first part of the book. Say, okay, here it is. And it really works. I mean, it really, when we actually put it to the test, you know, the low calorie density, all those various criteria, and it actually translates out. Okay, and then we spend the rest of the book, you know, tweaking that and making it work even better. Um, do you ever bring into the book, like, the kind of old school studies from Ornish and that sort of thing, or is this completely oh, new material? Oh, well, so... Uh, I guess they're still relevant, right? Well, so, you know, what's interesting about plant-based eating is that even in studies that weren't about weight loss, right? I mean, you put someone in a weight loss study, regardless of the intervention, there's something called a Hawthorne effect, meaning just being in a study affects your weight status because you know they're looking over your shoulder and they're going to weigh you again in three months. you got to go back in six months, right? And so even people who are on like a control, who are just like, yeah, continue to eat whatever you were eating. People actually change what they're eating because someone's looking over their shoulder, right? It's like a, you know, it's like a quantum you know, physics kind of thing. You look at a particle and, you know, um, and uh, can, affect a, uh, can affect the measurement. So, um, uh, and so that's why even in control groups, that's why we have control groups, is because people tend to lose weight regardless, just because, just being in a study. Um, and so you, you have someone in a weight loss study, they're like, oh, I'm supposed to be losing weight. Okay, but, but you know, lots of plant-based diet studies are done on like rheumatoid arthritis and reversing, you know, uh, migraines or Crohn's disease or multiple sclerosis or heart disease or diabetes, right? 
Nothing to do with weight loss. I mean, they don't, it's not explicitly. They're like, look, we want to make your rheumatoid arthritis go away. So we're going to put you on this kind of diet. We're not talking about calories. We're not talking about anything. And so then let's look at those studies. So that's the reason to look at those studies is, well, let's just see if they incidentally lost weight without even trying. I mean, they weren't even, I mean, and in many cases, they're not even overweight. Um, but let's just see what happens. No, and they lose weight. And so you can see, even in studies that aren't around weight loss, put people on a plant-based diet, and they can't help but come down to a healthier weight. So if there's so much evidence for this, why isn't it implemented? And what is it about the system? That, this is a big question, but what is it about the system that uh, means that the sort of uh, assimilation and distribution of the data isn't what you say and it that doesn't reflect what you also say? It's yeah, so, so it turns out, so right, I mean, you think if there was a safe, simple side effect free solution to obesity, we'd know about right now, right? I mean, like, um, well, so it takes on average about 17 years for research findings to make it into day-to-day clinical practice. Um, and look, I mean, and I think the heart disease example is a perfect one, right? I mean, I know it from, you know, my personal life, particularly poignant for my family, was heart disease, right? Um, with, you know, the reversal of my grandma's heart disease from Nathan Pritikin. You know, Ornus published 1990, uh, July 21st, um, decades ago. And even that, our number one killer of men and women, still lost in some rabbit hole, still hundreds of thousands of Americans alone, continue to die needlessly from this preventable, arrestable, reversible condition. So wait a second. If our number one, the cure to our number one killer is still listening out there, well, then pff, obesity, forget about it, right? I mean, it just shows that you can have all the science in the world, but the system can be aligned against you. And why? It's because of reimbursement issues, doesn't make anybody money. You cannot really profit from eating real food. I mean, the, the junk food industry, right, the processed food industry, trillion dollar industry, would love to sell you vegan junk food, low carb junk food, even ironically paleo junk food, right? Keto junk food, any kind of, what they can't make money from is whole food, right? So, I mean, we can sell you Apple Jacks, but selling apples just doesn't work. Orange Crush, but not actually oranges, right? I mean, there's, there's you just can't make it because, I mean, real food goes bad. I mean, produce actually goes bad. No, you want something that sits on the shelf, right? Good for shelf life, not good for human life. The system is just set up. It's not like the CEO of Coca-Cola is thinking, oh, how can I contribute to the childhood obesity epidemic? They're just thinking, how can I satisfy my shareholders for the next quarter? And how do you do that? Well, you you sell something for a couple bucks a bottle that costs literally a few pennies, right? Because you have this sugar subsidized by taxpayers. I mean, it's just a slam dunk. Whereas if you're trying to sell broccoli or something, not even branded, even a broccoli grower is not going to put an ad on TV for broccoli. They're, they're, the competitors will just, you, you buy a competitor's broccoli. It doesn't even make sense. The system is not set up to reward healthy behaviors. Um, and so that's why all the ads on TV are for garbage. That's why, I mean, this is just the system is set up to really against the health of you and your family. So you have to take responsibility for your own health, for your own family's health, for your own community's health and stick to what the science says.